Abraham Lincoln by George Haven Putnam Part 3 out of 4 was reared among these rude, energetic folk, had lived all those sorts of lives. He was no sport. His career is a triumphant refutation of the traditional views of genius. He had no special gift or quality to distinguish him. He was simply the best type of American at a historic juncture when the national safety wanted such a man. The confidence which all Americans express that their country will be equal to any emergency which may threaten it is not so entirely superstitious as it seems at first sight. For the career of Lincoln shows how it has been done in a country where the necessary man can be drawn not from a few leading families or an educated class, but from the millions. Rabbi Schechter, in an eloquent address delivered at the centennial celebration, speaks of Lincoln's personality as follows. The half-century that has elapsed since Lincoln's death has dispelled the mists that encompassed him on earth Men now not only recognize the right which he championed, but behold in him the standard of righteousness, of liberty, of conciliation, and truth. In him, as it were personified, stands the union, all that is best and noblest, and enduring in its principles, in which he devoutly believed and served mightily to save. When today... The world celebrates the century of his existence, he has become the ideal of both North and South, of a common country, composed not only of the factions that once confronted each other in war's dreadful array, but of the myriad thousands that have since found in the American nation the hope of the future and the refuge from age entrenched wrong and absolutism. To them, Lincoln, his life, his history, his character, his entire personality, with all its wondrous charm and grace, its sobriety, patience, self-abnegation, and sweetness, has come to be the very prototype of a rising humanity. Carl Schurz, himself a man of large nature and wide and sympathetic comprehension, says of Lincoln, in the most conspicuous position of the period, Lincoln drew upon himself the scoffs of polite society. But even then, he filled the souls of mankind with utterances of wonderful beauty and grandeur. It was distinctly the weird mixture in him of qualities and forces, of the lofty with the common, the ideal with the uncouth of that which he had become with that which he had not ceased to be, that made him so fascinating a character among his fellow men, that gave him his singular power over minds and hearts, that fitted him to be the greatest leader in the greatest crisis of our national life. He possessed the courage to stand alone, that courage which is the first requisite of leadership in a great cause. The charm of Lincoln's oratory flooded all the rare depth and genuineness of his convictions, and his sympathetic feelings were the strongest element in his nature. He was one of the greatest Americans and the best of men. The poet Whittier writes, The weary form that rested not save in a martyr's grave, The careworn face that none forgot, turned to the kneeling slave. We rest in peace where his sad eyes saw peril, strife, and pain. His was the awful sacrifice, and ours the priceless gain. Says Bryant, that task is done. The bound are free. We bear thee to an honored grave, whose noblest monument shall be the broken fetters of the slave. Pure was thy life, its bloody close hath blessed thee with the sons of light, 
among the noble host of those who perished in the cause of right. Says Lowell, Our children shall behold his fame, the kindly earnest, brave, foreseeing man sagacious. Patient, dreading praise, not blame, new birth of our new soil, the first American, Ordinary men die when their physical life is brought to a close, if perhaps not at once, yet in a brief space. The passing of the little circle of those to whom they were dear. The man of distinction lives for a time after death. His achievements and his character are held in appreciative remembrance by the community and the generation he has served. The waves of his influence ripple out in a somewhat wider circle before being lost in the ocean of time. We call that man great to whom it is given so to impress himself upon his fellow men by deed, by creation, by service to the community, by character, by the inspiration from on high that has been breathed through his soul that he is not permitted to die. Such a man secures immortality in this world. The knowledge and the influence of his life are extended throughout mankind, and his memory gathers increasing fame from generation to generation. It is thus that men are today honoring the memory of Abraham Lincoln. Today, one hundred years after his birth, and nearly half a century since the dramatic close of his life's work. Lincoln stands enshrined in the thought and in the hearts of his countrymen. He is our father Abraham, belonging to us, his fellow citizens, for ideals, for inspiration, and for affectionate regard. But he belongs now also to all mankind, for he has been canonized among the noblest of the world's heroes. Appendix The Address of Abraham Lincoln Delivered at Cooper Institute, New York February 27, 1860 With introduction by Charles C. Not Historical and Analytical Notes by Charles C. Not and Cephas Brainerd and with the correspondence between Mr. Lincoln and Mr. Knott as representative of the Committee of the Young Men's Republican Union. Introductory Note The address delivered by Lincoln at the Cooper Institute in February 1860 in response to the invitation of certain representative New Yorkers was as well in its character as in its results the most important of all of his utterances. The conscientious study of the historical and constitutional record, and the arguments and conclusions based upon the analysis of this record, were accepted by the Republican leaders as constituting the principles and the policy to be maintained during the presidential campaign of 1860 a campaign in which was involved not merely the election of a president, but the continued existence of the republic. Under the wise counsels represented by the words of Lincoln, the election was fought out substantially on two contentions. First, that the compact entered into by the fathers, and by their immediate successors, should be loyally carried out and that slavery should not be interfered with in the original slave states, or in the additional territory that had been conceded to it under the Missouri Compromise. And, secondly, that not a single further square mile of soil that was still free should be left available, or should be made available for the incursion of slavery. It was the conviction of Lincoln and of his associates, as it had been the conviction of the fathers, that under such a restriction slavery must certainly in the near future come to an end. 
It was because these convictions, both in the debates with Douglas and in the Cooper Institute speech, were presented by Lincoln more forcibly and more conclusively than had been done by any other political leader. That Lincoln secured the nomination and the presidency. The February address was assuredly a deciding factor in the great issue of the time, and it certainly belongs. Therefore, with the historic documents of the Republic, G. H. P. New York, September 1, 1909. Correspondence with Lincoln, Knott, and Brainerd. From Robert Lincoln, Manchester, Vermont. July 27, 1909. Dear Major Putnam, Your letter of July 23rd reaches me here and I beg to express my thanks for your kind remembrances of me in London. I am much interested in learning that you were present at the time my father made his speech at Cooper Institute. I, of course, remember the occasion very well, although I was not present. I was at that time in the middle of my year at Phillips Exeter Academy preparing for the Harvard entrance examination of the summer of 1860. After the Cooper Institute address, my father came to Exeter to see how I was getting along, and this visit resulted in his making a number of speeches in New England on his way and on his return. And at Exeter he wrote to my mother a letter which was mainly concerned with me, but which did make reference to these speeches. He said that he had had some embarrassment with these New England speeches, because in coming east he had anticipated making no speech excepting the one at the Cooper Institute, and he had not prepared himself for anything else. In the later speeches, he was addressing reading audiences who had, as he thought probable, seeing the report of his Cooper Institute speech, and he was obliged, therefore. From day to day he made about a dozen speeches in New England in all to bear that fact in mind. Sincerely yours, Robert Lincoln, from Judge Knott. Williamstown, Mass. July 26, 1909, dear Putnam, I consider it very desirable that the report of Mr. Lincoln's speech, embodying the final revision, should be preserved in book form. The text in the pamphlet now in your hands is authentic and conclusive. Mr. Lincoln read the proof both of the address and of the notes. I am glad that you are to include in your reprint the letters from Mr. Lincoln, as these letters authenticate this copy of the address as the copy which was corrected by him with his own hand. The preface to the address, written in September 1860, has interest because it shows what we thought of the address at that time. Your worthy father was, if I remember rightly, one of the vice presidents of the meeting. Yours faithfully. Charles C. Knott, from Cephas Brainerd, New York, August 18, 1909. Dear Major Putnam, I am very glad to learn that there is good prospect that the real Lincoln Cooper Institute address, with the evidence in regard to it, will now be available for the public. I am glad also that with the address you are proposing to print the letters received by Judge Knott from Mr. Lincoln. One or two of these have, unfortunately, not been preserved. I recall in one an observation made by Lincoln to the effect that he was not much of a literary man. I did not see much of Mr. Lincoln when he was in New York 
as my most active responsibility in regard to the meeting was in getting up an audience. I remember in handing some weeks earlier to John Sherman, who, like Lincoln, had never before spoken in New York. Five ten-dollar gold pieces that he said he had not expected his expenses to be paid. At a lunch that was given to Sherman a long time afterward, I referred to that meeting. Sherman cocked his eye at me and said, Yes, I remember it very well. I never was so scart in all my life. The observations of Judge Knott in regard to the meeting are about as just as anything that has ever been put into print. And as I concur fully in the accuracy of these recollections, I do not undertake to give my own impressions at any length. I was expecting to hear some specimen of Western stump speaking as it was then understood. You will, of course, observe that the speech contains nothing of the kind. I do remember, however, that Lincoln spoke of the condition of feeling between the North and the South. He refers to the treatment which Northern men received in the South, and he remarked, parenthetically, that he had never known of a man who had been able to whip his wife into loving him, an observation that produced laughter. In making up the notes we ransacked, as you may be sure, all the material available in the libraries in New York. And I also had interviews as to one special point with Mr. Bancroft, with Mr. Hildreth, and with Dr. William Goodell, who was in those times a famous anti-slavery man. Your father and William Curtis Noyes were possibly more completely in sympathy than any other two men in New York. With the efforts of these younger men, they impressed me as standing in that respect on the same plane. The next man to them was Charles Willies Eliot, the author of A History of New England. We never went to your father for advice or assistance when he failed to help us, and he was always so kindly and gentle in what he did, and said that every one of us youngsters acquired for him a very great affection. He always had time to see us and was always on hand, when he was wanted, and if we desired to have anything. We got it if he had it. Neither your father, nor Mr. Noyes, nor, for that matter, Mr. Elliot, ever suggested that we were young or fresh or anything of that sort. The enthusiasm which young fellows have was always recognized by these men as an exceedingly valuable asset in the cause. Pardon all this from a veteran, and believe me, sincerely yours. Cephas Brainerd, Introduction by Charles C. Knott. The Cooper Institute address is one of the most important addresses ever delivered in the life of this nation. For, at an eventful time, it changed the course of history. When Mr. Lincoln rose to speak on the evening of February 27, 1860, he had held no administrative office. He had endeavored to be appointed commissioner of patents, and had failed. He had sought to be elected United States senator, and had been defeated. He had been a member of Congress, yet it was not even remembered. He was a lawyer in humble circumstances, persuasive of juries, but had not reached the front rank of the Illinois bar. The record which Mr. Lincoln himself placed in the Congressional Directory in 1847 might still be taken as the record of his public and official life, born February 12, 1809, in Hardin County, Kentucky, education defective. Profession a lawyer, 
have been a captain of volunteers in the Black Hawk War. Postmaster in a very small office. Four times a member of the Illinois legislature and a member of the lower house of Congress. Was this the record of a man who should be made the head of a nation in troubled times? In the estimation of thoughtful Americans east of the Alleghenies, all that they knew of Mr. Lincoln justified them in regarding him as only a Western stump orator successful. Distinguished, but nothing higher than that a Western stump orator who had dared to brave one of the strongest men in the Western states and who had done so with wonderful ability and moral success. When Mr. Lincoln closed his address, he had risen to the rank of statesman, and had stamped himself a statesman peculiarly fitted for the exigency of the hour. Mr. William Cullen Bryant presided at the meeting, and a number of the first and ablest citizens of New York were present. Among them Horace Greeley. Mr. Greeley was pronounced in his appreciation of the address. It was the ablest, the greatest, the wisest speech that had yet been made. It would reassure the conservative northerner. It was just what was wanted to conciliate the excited southerner. It was conclusive in its argument, and would assure the overthrow of Douglas. Mr. Horace White has recently written, I chanced to open the other day his Cooper Institute speech. This is one of the few printed speeches that I did not hear him deliver in person. As I read the concluding pages of that speech, the conflict of opinion that preceded the conflict of arms then sweeping upon the country like an approaching solar eclipse seemed prefigured like a chapter of the Book of Fate. Here again, he was the Old Testament prophet, before whom Horace Greeley bowed his head, saying that he had never listened to a greater speech. Although he had heard several of Webster's best, later, Mr. Greeley became the leader of the Republican forces opposed to the nomination of Mr. Seward, and was instrumental in concentrating those forces upon Mr. Lincoln. Furthermore, the great New York press on the following morning carried the address to the country, and before Mr. Lincoln left New York, he was telegraphed from Connecticut to come and aid in the campaign of the approaching spring election. He went, and when the fateful moment came in the convention, Connecticut was one of the eastern states which first broke away from the Seward column and went over to Mr. Lincoln. When Connecticut did this, the die was cast. It is difficult for younger generations of Americans to believe that three months before Mr. Lincoln was nominated for the presidency he was neither appreciated nor known in New York. That fact can be better established by a single incident than by the opinions and assurances of a dozen men. After the address had been delivered, Mr. Lincoln was taken by two members of the Young Men's Central Republican Union, Mr. Hiram Barney, afterward collector of the Port of New York, and Mr. Knott, one of the subsequent editors of the address to their club. The Athenaeum, where a very simple supper was ordered, and five or six Republican members of the club who chanced to be in the building were invited in. The supper was informal as informal as anything could be. The conversation was easy and familiar. The prospects of the Republican Party in the coming struggle were talked over, and so little was it supposed by the gentleman who had not heard the address that Mr. Lincoln could possibly be the candidate that one of them, Mr. Charles W. Eliot, asked artlessly, Mr. Lincoln, what candidate do you really think would be most likely to carry Illinois? Mr. Lincoln answered by illustration, Illinois is a peculiar state. 
in three parts. In northern Illinois, Mr. Seward would have a larger majority than I could get. In middle Illinois, I think I could call out a larger vote than Mr. Seward. In southern Illinois, it would make no difference who was the candidate. This answer was taken to be merely illustrative by everybody except, perhaps, Mr. Barney and Mr. Knott, each of whom, it subsequently appeared, had particularly noted Mr. Lincoln's reply. The little party broke up. Mr. Lincoln had been cordially received but certainly had not been flattered. The others shook him by the hand and, as they put on their overcoats, said, Mr. Knott is going downtown and he will show you the way to the Astor house. Mr. Lincoln and Mr. Knott started on foot, but the latter observing that Mr. Lincoln was apparently walking with some difficulty said, are you lame, Mr. Lincoln? He replied that he had on new boots and they hurt him. The two gentlemen then boarded a street car when they reached the place where Mr. Knott would leave the car on his way home. He shook Mr. Lincoln by the hand and, bidding him goodbye, told him that this car would carry him to the side door of the Astor house. Mr. Lincoln went on alone, the only occupant of the car. The next time he came to New York, he rode down Broadway to the Astor house standing erect in an open barouch drawn by four white horses. He bowed to the patriotic thousands in the street, on the sidewalks, in the windows, on the house tops and they cheered him as the lawfully elected President of the United States and bade him go on and, with God's help, save the Union. His companion in the streetcar has often wondered since then what Mr. Lincoln thought about during the remainder of his ride that night to the Astor House. The Cooper Institute had, owing to a snowstorm, not been full, and its intelligent, respectable, nonpartisan audience had not wrung out enthusiastic applause like a concourse of Western auditors magnetized by their own enthusiasm. Had the address the most carefully prepared, the most elaborately investigated and demonstrated and verified of all the work of his life been a failure, but in the matter of quality and ability, if not of quantity and enthusiasm, he had never addressed such an audience, and some of the ablest men in the northern states had expressed their opinion of the address in terms which left no doubt of the highest appreciation. Did Mr. Lincoln regard the address which he had just delivered to a small and critical audience as a success? Did he have the faintest glimmer of the brilliant effect which was to follow? Did he feel the loneliness of the situation, the want of his loyal Illinois adherents? Did his sinking heart infer that he was but a speck of humanity to which the great city would never again give a thought? He was a plain man, an ungainly man, unadorned, apparently uncultivated, showing the awkwardness of self-conscious rusticity. His dress that night before a New York audience was the most unbecoming that a fiend's ingenuity could have devised for a tall, gaunt man a black frock coat, ill-setting and too short for him in the body, skirt, and arms a rolling collar, low down disclosing his long, thin, shriveled throat uncovered and exposed, no man in all New York appeared that night more simple, more unassuming, more conscious of his own defects than Abraham Lincoln, and yet we now know that within his soul there burned the fires of an unbounded ambition. 
sustained by a self-reliance and self-esteem that bade him fix his gaze upon the very pinnacle of American fame and aspire to it in a time so troubled that its dangers appalled the soul of every American. What were this man's thoughts when he was left alone? Did a faint shadow of the future rest upon his soul? Did he feel in some mysterious way that on that night he had crossed the Rubicon of his life march that care and trouble and political discord and slander and misrepresentation and ridicule and public responsibilities, such as hardly ever before burdened a conscientious soul, coupled with war and defeat and disaster, were to be thenceforth his portion nearly to his life's end, and that his end was to be a bloody act which would appall the world and send a thrill of horror through the hearts of friends and enemies alike. So that when the woeful tidings came the bravest of the southern brave should burst into tears and cry aloud, Oh, the unhappy South! And when it was too late, when the car was beyond call, he blamed himself for not accompanying Mr. Lincoln to the Astor House not because he was a distinguished stranger, but because he seemed a sad and lonely man. February 12, 1908 Correspondence with Mr. Lincoln 69 Wall St. New York February 9, 1860 Dear Sir, the Young Men's Central Republican Union of this city very cordially desire that you should deliver during the ensuing month what I may term a political lecture. The peculiarities of the case are these a series of lectures has been determined upon the first was delivered by Mr. Blair of St. Louis a short time ago the second will be in a few days by Mr. C. M. Clay, and the third we would prefer to have from you, rather than from any other person. Of the audience I should add that it is not that of an ordinary political meeting. These lectures have been contrived to call out our better, but busier citizens, who never attend political meetings. A large part of the audience would also consist of ladies. The time we should prefer would be about the middle of March, but if any earlier or later day will be more convenient for you, we would alter our arrangements. Allow me to hope that we shall have the pleasure of welcoming you to New York. You are, I believe, an entire stranger to your Republican brethren here, but they have for you the highest esteem and your celebrated contest with Judge Douglas awoke their warmest sympathy and admiration. Those of us who are in the ranks would regard your presence as very material aid, and as an honor and pleasure, which I cannot sufficiently express. Respectfully, Charles C. Knott, to Honorable Abraham Lincoln, 69 Wall St. New York, May 23, 1860. Dear Sir, I enclose a copy of your address in New York. We, the Young Men's Rep. Union, designed to publish a new edition in larger type and better form, with such notes and references as will best attract readers seeking information. Have you any memoranda of your investigations which you would approve of inserting? You and your Western friends, I think, underrate this speech. It has produced a greater effect here than any other single speech. It is the real platform in the Eastern states and must carry the conservative element in New York, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, therefore I desire that it should be as nearly perfect as may be. Most of the emendations are trivial and do not affect the substance all are merely suggested for your judgment. 
I cannot help adding that this speech is an extraordinary example of condensed English. After some experience in criticizing for reviews, I find hardly anything to touch and nothing to omit. It is the only one I know of which I cannot shorten, and like a good arch moving one word tumbles a whole sentence down. Finally, it being a bad and foolish thing for a candidate to write letters, and you having doubtless more to do of that than is pleasant or profitable. We will not add to your burden in that regard, but if you will let any friend who has nothing to do advise us as to your wishes. In this or any other matter, we will try to carry them out. Respectfully, Charles C. Knott, to Honorable Abraham Lincoln, Springfield, Hills, May 31, 1860, Charles C. Knott, Esk. My dear sir, yours of the 23rd, accompanied by a copy of the speech delivered by me at the Cuber Institute and upon which you have made some notes for emendations, was received some days ago, of course I would not object to, but would be pleased, rather, with a more perfect edition of that speech. I did not preserve memoranda of my investigations, and I could not now re-examine and make notes without an expenditure of time, which I cannot bestow upon it some of your notes I do not understand. So far as it is intended merely to improve in grammar and elegance of composition, I am quite agreed. But I do not wish the sense changed or modified to a hair's breadth and you, not having studied the particular points so closely as I have, cannot be quite sure that you do not change the sense when you do not intend it, for instance, in a note at bottom of first page. You propose to substitute Democrats for Douglas, but what I am saying there is true of Douglas, and is not true of Democrats generally, so that the proposed substitution would be a very considerable blunder your proposed insertion of residences though it would do little or no harm is not at all necessary to the sense i was trying to convey on page five your proposed grammatical change would certainly do no harm the impudently absurd i stick to the striking out he and inserting we turns the sense exactly wrong the striking out upon it leaves the sense too general and incomplete the senses act as they acted upon that question not as they acted generally after considering your proposed changes on page 7, I do not think them material, but I am willing to defer to you in relation to them. On page 9, striking out to us is probably right, the word lawyers I wish retained. The word courts struck out twice, I wish reduced to court and retained court, as a collection more properly governs the plural have as I understand the preceding court. In the latter case must also be retained the words quite, as, and, or on the same page, I wish retained. The italicizing and quotation marking, I have no objection to. As to the note at bottom, I do not think any too much is admitted what you propose on page 11 is right. I return your copy of the speech, together with one printed here, under my own hasty supervising. That at New York was printed without any supervision by me. If you conclude to publish a new edition, allow me to see the proof sheets. And now thanking you for your very complimentary letter, and your interest for me generally, I subscribe myself. Your friend and servant, A. Lincoln, 69 Wall Street, New York. 
August 28, 1860. Dear Sir, Mr. Judd insists on our printing the revised edition of your Cooper Inns. Speech without waiting to send you the proofs. If this is so determined, I wish you to know that I have made no alterations other than those you sanctioned. Except, 1. I do not find that Abraham Baldwin voted on the Ordinance of 87. On the contrary, he appears not to have acted with Congress during the sitting of the Convention. W. M. Pierce seems to have taken his place then and his name is recorded as voting for the ordinance. This makes no difference in the result, but I presume you will not wish the historical inaccuracy if it is such to stand. I will therefore, unless you write to the contrary, strike out his name in that place and reduce the number from four to three where you sum up the number of times he voted. 2. In the quotations from the Constitution I have given its exact language as delegated instead of granted, etc. As it is given in quote marks, I presume the exact letter of the text should be followed. If these are not correct, please write immediately. Our apology for the delay is that we have been weighed down by other matters mine, that I have but today returned to town, respectfully. Charles C. Knott, to Honorable Abraham Lincoln, 69 Wall Street, N. Y. Sept. 17, 1860. Dear Sir, we forward you by this day's express 250 copies, with the last corrections. I delayed sending, thinking that you would prefer these to those first printed. The Abraham Baldwin letter referred to in your last, I regret to say, has not arrived. From your not touching the proofs in that regard, I inferred and hope that the correction was not itself an error. Should you wish a larger number of copies, do not hesitate to let us know. It will afford us much pleasure to furnish them, and no inconvenience whatever. Respectfully, etc. Charles C. Knott. Honorable A. Lincoln. Springfield. Ills. Sept. 22, 1860. Charles C. Knott. Esk. My dear sir. Yours of the 17th was duly received. The 250 copies have not yet arrived. I am greatly obliged to you for what you have done and what you propose to do. The Abraham Baldwin letter in substance was that I could not find the Journal of the Confederation Congress for the session at which was passed the Ordinance of 1787 and that in stating Mr. Baldwin had voted for its passage. I had relied on a communication of Mr. Greeley over his own signature, published in the New York Weekly Tribune of October 15, 1859. If you will turn to that paper, you will there see that Mr. Greeley apparently copies from the journal and places the name of Mr. Baldwin among those of the men who voted for the measure. Still, if the journal itself shows differently, of course it is right. Yours very truly, A. Lincoln, the address of the Han. Abraham Lincoln, in vindication of the policy of the framers of the Constitution and the principles of the Republican Party. Delivered at Cooper Institute. February 27, 1860, issued by the Young Men's Republican Union. With notes by Charles C. Knott and Cephas Brainerd, members of the Board of Control, officers of the Union,
Charles T. Rogers, President. Dexter A. Hawkins, Vice President. Erasmus Sterling, Secretary. William M. Franklin, Treasurer. Executive Committee. Cephas Brainerd, Chairman. Benjamin P. Manier, Richard C. McCormick. Charles C. Not Charles H. Cooper, P. G. DeGraw, James H. Welsh, E. C. Johnson, Louis M. Peck, Advisory Board, W. M. Cullen Bryant, Daniel Drew, Hiram Barney, William V. Brady, John J., George W. Blunt, Henry A. Hurlbut, Abijah Mann, J. R. Hamilton Fish, Francis Hall, Horace Greeley, Charles A. Peabody, Edgar Ketchum, James Kelly, George Folsom, William Curtis Noyes, Benjamin F. Manier, Preface. This edition of Mr. Lincoln's Address has been prepared and published by the Young Men's Republican Union of New York. To exemplify its wisdom, truthfulness, and learning, no one who has not actually attempted to verify its details can understand the patient research and historical labor which it embodies. The history of our earlier politics is scattered through numerous journals, statutes, pamphlets, and letters. And these are defective in completeness and accuracy of statement, and in indices and tables of contents. Neither can any one who has not traveled over this precise ground appreciate the accuracy of every trivial detail. Or, the self-denying impartiality with which Mr. Lincoln has turned from the testimony of the fathers on the general question of slavery. To present the single question which he discusses, from the first line to the last from his premises to his conclusion, he travels with swift, unerring directness which no logician ever excelled an argument complete and full. Without the affectation of learning, and without the stiffness which usually accompanies dates and details. A single, easy, simple sentence of plain Anglo-Saxon words contains a chapter of history that, in some instances, has taken days of labor to verify, and which must have cost the author months of investigation to acquire. And, though the public should justly estimate the labor bestowed on the facts which are stated, they cannot estimate the greater labor involved on those which are omitted how many pages have been read how many works examined what numerous statutes, resolutions, speeches, letters, and biographies have been looked through. Commencing with this address, as a political pamphlet, the reader will leave it as an historical work brief. Complete, profound, impartial, truthful, which will survive the time and the occasion that called it forth, and be esteemed hereafter, no less for its intrinsic worth than its unpretending modesty. New York, September, 1860. Address, Mr. President and fellow citizens of New York. The facts with which I shall deal this evening are mainly old and familiar. Nor is there anything new in the general use I shall make of them. If there shall be any novelty, it will be in the mode of presenting the facts and the inferences and observations following that presentation. In his speech last autumn, at Columbus, Ohio, as reported in the New York Times, Senator Douglas said, Our fathers, when they framed the government under which we live, understood this question just as well, and even better than we do now, 
I fully endorse this, and I adopt it as a text for this discourse. I so adopt it because it furnishes a precise and an agreed starting point for a discussion between Republicans and that wing of the democracy headed by Senator Douglas. It simply leaves the inquiry, what was the understanding those fathers had of the question mentioned? What is the frame of government under which we live? The answer must be, the Constitution of the United States. That Constitution consists of the original, framed in 1787, and under which the present government first went into operation, and twelve subsequently framed amendments, the first ten of which were framed in 1789. Who were our fathers that framed the Constitution? I suppose the 39 who signed the original instrument may be fairly called our fathers who framed that part of the present government. It is almost exactly true to say they framed it, and it is altogether true to say they fairly represented the opinion and sentiment of the whole nation at that time. Their names being familiar to nearly all, and accessible to quite all need not now be repeated. I take these thirty-nine for the present as being our fathers who framed the government under which we live. What is the question which, according to the text, those fathers understood just as well, and even better than we do now? It is this. Does the proper division of local from federal authority, or anything in the Constitution, forbid our federal government to control as to slavery in our federal territories? Upon this, Senator Douglas holds the affirmative, and Republicans the negative. This affirmation and denial form an issue and this issue, this question, is precisely what the text declares our fathers understood better than we. Let us now inquire whether the thirty-nine, or any of them, ever acted upon this question. And if they did, how they acted upon it, how they expressed that better understanding. In 1784, three years before the Constitution, the United States then owning the Northwestern Territory, and no other, the Congress of the Confederation, had before them the question of prohibiting slavery in that territory, and four of the thirty-nine who afterward framed the Constitution were in that Congress and voted on that question. Of these, Roger Sherman, Thomas Mifflin and Hugh Williamson voted for the prohibition, thus showing that, in their understanding, no line dividing local from federal authority, nor anything else, properly forbade the federal government to control as to slavery in federal territory. The other of the four James M. Henry voted against the prohibition, showing that, for some cause, he thought it improper to vote for it. In 1787, still before the Constitution, but while the Convention was in session framing it, and while the Northwestern Territory still was the only territory owned by the United States, the same question of prohibiting slavery in the territories again came before the Congress of the Confederation and two more of the thirty-nine who afterward signed the Constitution were in that Congress and voted on the question. They were William Blount and William Few, and they both voted for the prohibition thus showing that, in their understanding, no line dividing local from federal authority, nor anything else, properly forbade the federal government to control as to slavery in federal territory. This time, the prohibition became a law, 
being part of what is now well known as the Ordinance of 87. The question of federal control of slavery in the territories seems not to have been directly before the convention, which framed the original Constitution. And hence it is not recorded that the 39 or any of them, while engaged on that instrument, expressed any opinion on that precise question. In 1789, by the first Congress which sat under the Constitution, an act was passed to enforce the Ordinance of 87, including the prohibition of slavery in the Northwestern Territory. The bill for this act was reported by one of the 39, Thomas Fitzsimmons, then a member of the House of Representatives from Pennsylvania. It went through all its stages without a word of opposition, and finally passed both branches without yeas and nays, which is equivalent to an unanimous passage. In this Congress, there were 16 of the 39 fathers who framed the original Constitution. They were John Langdon, Nicholas Oilman, W.M.S. Johnson, Roger Sherman, Robert Morris. Thos. Fitzsimmons, William Few, Abraham Baldwin, Rufus King, William Patterson, George Clymer, Richard Bassett, George Reed, Pierce Butler, Daniel Carroll, James Madison. This shows that, in their understanding, no line dividing local from federal authority nor anything in the Constitution. Properly forbade Congress to prohibit slavery in the federal territory, else both their fidelity to correct principle and their oath to support the Constitution would have constrained them to oppose the prohibition. Again, George Washington, another of the 39, was then President of the United States, and, as such, approved and signed the bill, thus completing its validity as a law, and thus showing that, in his understanding, no line dividing local from federal authority, nor anything in the Constitution, forbade the federal government to control as to slavery in federal territory. No great while after the adoption of the original Constitution, North Carolina ceded to the federal government the country now constituting the state of Tennessee. And a few years later Georgia ceded that which now constitutes the states of Mississippi and Alabama. In both deeds of session it was made a condition by the ceding states that the federal government should not prohibit slavery in the ceded country. Besides this, slavery was then actually in the ceded country. Under these circumstances, Congress, on taking charge of these countries, did not absolutely prohibit slavery within them. They did interfere with it, take control of it even there to a certain extent, in 1798, Congress organized the Territory of Mississippi. In the act of organization, they prohibited the bringing of slaves into the territory from any place without the United States by fine and giving freedom to slaves so brought. This act passed both branches of Congress without yeas and nays, in that Congress were three of the 39 who framed the original Constitution. They were John Langdon, George Reed, and Abraham Baldwin. They all probably voted for it. Certainly they would have placed their opposition to it upon record. If, in their understanding, any line dividing local from federal authority or anything in the Constitution, 
properly forbade the federal government to control as to slavery in federal territory. In 1803, the federal government purchased the Louisiana country. Our former territorial acquisitions came from certain of our own states, but this Louisiana country was acquired from a foreign nation. In 1804, Congress gave a territorial organization to that part of it, which now constitutes the state of Louisiana. New Orleans, lying within that part, was an old and comparatively large city. There were other considerable towns and settlements, and slavery was extensively and thoroughly intermingled with the people. Congress did not, in the Territorial Act, prohibit slavery, but they did interfere with it, take control of it in a more marked and extensive way than they did in the case of Mississippi. The substance of the provision therein made, in relation to slaves, was, First, that no slave should be imported into the territory from foreign parts. Second, that no slave should be carried into it who had been imported into the United States since the first day of May. 1798. Third, that no slave should be carried into it except by the owner and for his own use as a settler. The penalty in all the cases being a fine upon the violator of the law and freedom to the slave. This act also was passed without yeas and nays. In the Congress which passed it, there were two of the thirty nine. They were Abraham Baldwin and Jonathan Dayton. As stated in the case of Mississippi, it is probable they both voted for it. They would not have allowed it to pass without recording their opposition to it, if in their understanding it violated either the line properly dividing local from federal authority or any provision of the Constitution. In 1819-20 came and passed the Missouri question. Many votes were taken by yeas and nays in both branches of Congress. Upon the various phases of the general question, two of the 39 Rufus King and Charles Pinckney were members of that Congress. Mr. King steadily voted for slavery prohibition and against all compromises, while Mr. Pinckney as steadily voted against slavery prohibition and against all compromises. By this, Mr. King showed that, in his understanding, no line dividing local from federal authority, nor anything in the Constitution, was violated by Congress prohibiting slavery in federal territory, while Mr. Pinckney, by his votes, showed that, in his understanding, there was some sufficient reason for opposing such prohibition in that case. The cases I have mentioned are the only acts of the 39, or of any of them, upon the direct issue, which I have been able to discover, to enumerate the persons who thus acted, as being four in 1784, two in 1787, 17 in 1789, 3 in 1798, 2 in 1804, and 2 in 1819 20, there would be 30 of them. But this would be counting John Langdon, Roger Sherman, William Few, Rufus King, and George Reed each twice. 
and Abraham Baldwin three times. The true number of those of the thirty-nine whom I have shown to have acted upon the question, which, by the text, they understood better than we, is twenty-three, leaving sixteen not shown to have acted upon it in any way. Here, then, we have twenty-three out of our thirty-nine fathers who framed the government under which we live, who have, upon their official responsibility and their corporal oaths, acted upon the very question which the text affirms they understood just as well, and even better than we do now, and twenty-one of them, a clear majority of the whole thirty-nine, so acting upon it, as to make them guilty of gross political impropriety and willful perjury. If, in their understanding, any proper division between local and federal authority, or anything in the Constitution, they had made themselves, and sworn to support, forbade the federal government to control as to slavery in the federal territories. Thus, the twenty-one acted, and, as actions speak louder than words, so actions under such responsibility speak still louder. Two of the twenty-three voted against congressional prohibition of slavery in the federal territories. In the instances in which they acted upon the question, but for what reasons they so voted is not known. They may have done so, because they thought a proper division of local from federal authority, or some provision or principle of the Constitution, stood in the way, or they may, without any such question, have voted against the prohibition on what appeared to them to be sufficient grounds of expediency. No one who has sworn to support the Constitution can conscientiously vote for what he understands to be an unconstitutional measure. However expedient he may think it, but one may and ought to vote against a measure which he deems constitutional. If, at the same time, he deems it inexpedient, it therefore would be unsafe to set down even the two who voted against the prohibition as having done so because, in their understanding, any proper division of local from federal authority, or anything in the Constitution, forbade the federal government to control as to slavery in federal territory. The remaining sixteen of the thirty-nine, so far as I have discovered, have left no record of their understanding upon the direct question of federal control of slavery in the federal territories. But there is much reason to believe that their understanding upon that question would not have appeared different from that of their twenty-three compeers. Had it been manifested at all, for the purpose of adhering rigidly to the text, I have purposely omitted whatever understanding may have been manifested by any person, however distinguished, other than the thirty-nine fathers who framed the original Constitution. And, for the same reason, I have also omitted whatever understanding may have been manifested by any of the thirty-nine even on any other phase of the general question of slavery. If we should look into their acts and declarations on those other phases, as the foreign slave trade, and the morality and policy of slavery generally, it would appear to us that on the direct question of federal control of slavery in federal territories, the sixteen, if they had acted at all, would probably have acted just as the twenty-three did. Among that sixteen were several of the most noted anti-slavery men of those times as Dr. Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, and Gouverneur Morris, while there was not one now known to have been otherwise, unless it may be John Ruttelch. 
of South Carolina. The sum of the whole is that of our 39 fathers who framed the original Constitution. 21. A clear majority of the whole certainly understood that no proper division of local from federal authority, nor any part of the Constitution, forbade the federal government to control slavery in the federal territories, while all the rest probably had the same understanding. Such, unquestionably, was the understanding of our fathers who framed the original Constitution. And the text affirms that they understood the question better than we. But, so far, I have been considering the understanding of the question manifested by the framers of the original Constitution. In and by the original instrument, a mode was provided for amending it, and, as I have already stated, the present frame of the government under which we live consists of that original, and twelve amendatory articles framed and adopted since. Those who now insist that federal control of slavery in federal territories violates the Constitution point us to the provisions which they suppose it thus violates, and, as I understand, they all fix upon provisions in these amendatory articles and not in the original instrument. The Supreme Court, in the Dred Scott case, plant themselves upon the Fifth Amendment, which provides that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, while Senator Douglas and his peculiar adherents plant themselves upon the Tenth Amendment, providing that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. Now, it so happens that these amendments were framed by the First Congress, which sat under the Constitution, the identical Congress which passed the act already mentioned. Enforcing the prohibition of slavery in the Northwestern Territory, not only was it the same Congress, but they were the identical same individual men who, at the same session, and at the same time within the session, had under consideration and in progress toward maturity, these constitutional amendments and this act prohibiting slavery in all the territory the nation then owned. The constitutional amendments were introduced before and passed after the act enforcing the Ordinance of 87, so that, during the whole pendency of the act to enforce the Ordinance, the constitutional amendments were also pending. The 76 members of that Congress, including 16 of the framers of the original Constitution, as before stated, were preeminently our fathers who framed that part of the government under which we live, which is now claimed as forbidding the federal government to control slavery in the federal territories. Is it not a little presumptuous in any one at this day to affirm that the two things which that Congress deliberately framed and carried to maturity at the same time are absolutely inconsistent with each other, and does not such affirmation become impudently absurd when coupled with the other affirmation from the same mouth? That those who did the two things, alleged to be inconsistent, understood whether they really were inconsistent better than we better than he who affirms that they are inconsistent. It is surely safe to assume that the 39 framers of the original Constitution and the 76 members of the Congress which framed the amendments thereto, taken together, do certainly include those who may be fairly called our fathers who framed the government under which we live. And so assuming, 
I defy any man to show that any one of them ever, in his whole life, declared that, in his understanding, any proper division of local from federal authority, or any part of the Constitution, forbade the federal government to control as to slavery in the federal territories. I go a step further. I defy any one to show that any living man in the whole world ever did, prior to the beginning of the present century. And I might almost say prior to the beginning of the last half of the present century, declare that, in his understanding, any proper division of local from federal authority, or any part of the Constitution, forbade the federal government to control as to slavery in the federal territories. To those who now so declare, I give not only our fathers who framed the government under which we live, but with them all other living men within the century in which it was framed, among whom to search, and they shall not be able to find the evidence of a single man agreeing with them. Now, and here, let me guard a little against being misunderstood. I do not mean to say we are bound to follow implicitly in whatever our fathers did. To do so would be to discard all the lights of current experience to reject all progress, all improvement. What I do say is, that if we would supplant the opinions and policy of our fathers in any case, we should do so upon evidence so conclusive and argument so clear that even their great authority, fairly considered and weighed, cannot stand, and most surely not in a case whereof we ourselves declare they understood the question better than we. If any man at this day sincerely believes that a proper division of local from federal authority or any part of the Constitution forbids the federal government to control as to slavery in the federal territories, he is right to say so, and to enforce his position by all truthful evidence and fair argument which he can. But he has no right to mislead others, who have less access to history, and less leisure to study it, into the false belief that our fathers, who framed the government under which we live, were of the same opinion thus substituting falsehood and deception for truthful evidence and fair argument. If any man at this day sincerely believes our fathers, who framed the government under which we live, used and applied principles. In other cases, which ought to have led them to understand that a proper division of local from federal authority or some part of the Constitution forbids the federal government to control as to slavery in the federal territories, he is right to say so. But he should, at the same time, brave the responsibility of declaring that, in his opinion, he understands their principles better than they did themselves. And especially should he not shirk that responsibility by asserting that they understood the question just as well, and even better, than we do now, but enough, let all who believe that our fathers, who framed the government under which we live, understood this question just as well, and even better, than we do now, speak as they spoke, and act as they acted upon it. This is all Republicans ask all Republicans desire in relation to slavery. As those fathers marked it, so let it be again marked as an evil not to be extended, but to be tolerated and protected only because of and so far as its actual presence among us makes that toleration and protection a necessity. Let all the guarantees those fathers gave it be, not grudgingly, 
but fully and fairly maintained. For this Republicans contend, and with this, so far as I know or believe, they will be content. And now, if they would listen, as I suppose they will not, I would address a few words to the Southern people. I would say to them, you consider yourselves a reasonable and a just people, and I consider that in the general qualities of reason and justice you are not inferior to any other people. Still, when you speak of us Republicans, you do so only to denounce us as reptiles, or, at the best, as no better than outlaws. You will grant a hearing to pirates or murderers, but nothing like it to black republicans. In all your contentions with one another each of you deems an unconditional condemnation of black republicanism as the first thing to be attended to. Indeed, such condemnation of us seems to be an indispensable prerequisite license, so to speak among you to be admitted or permitted to speak at all. Now, can you or not be prevailed upon to pause and to consider whether this is quite just to us or even to yourselves? Bring forward your charges and specifications and then be patient long enough to hear us deny or justify. You say we are sectional. We deny it. That makes an issue, and the burden of proof is upon you. You produce your proof, and what is it? Why? That our party has no existence in your section gets no votes in your section. The fact is substantially true. But does it prove the issue? If it does, then in case we should, without change of principle, begin to get votes in your section, we should thereby cease to be sectional. You cannot escape this conclusion, and yet, are you willing to abide by it? If you are, you will probably soon find that we have ceased to be sectional. For we shall get votes in your section this very year. You will then begin to discover, as the truth plainly is, that your proof does not touch the issue. The fact that we get no votes in your section is a fact of your making and not of ours. And if there be fault in that fact, that fault is primarily yours and remains so until you show that we repel you by some wrong principle or practice. If we do repel you by any wrong principle or practice, the fault is ours, but this brings you to where you ought to have started to a discussion of the right or wrong of our principle. If our principle put in practice would wrong your section for the benefit of ours or for any other object, then our principle, and we with it, are sectional, and are justly opposed and denounced as such. Meet us, then, on the question of whether our principle, put in practice, would wrong your section. And so meet us as if it were possible that something may be said on our side. Do you accept the challenge? No, then you really believe that the principle which our fathers who framed the government under which we live thought so clearly right as to adopt it and endorse it again and again upon their official oaths is in fact so clearly wrong as to demand your condemnation without a moment's consideration. Some of you delight to flaunt in our faces the warning against sectional parties given by Washington in his farewell address. Less than eight years before Washington gave that warning, he had, as President of the United States, approved and signed an act of Congress enforcing the prohibition of slavery in the Northwestern Territory which act embodied the policy of the government upon that subject up to 
and at the very moment he penned that warning. And about one year after he penned it, he wrote Lafayette that he considered that prohibition a wise measure, expressing in the same connection his hope that we should at some time have a confederacy of free states. Bearing this in mind, and seeing that sectionalism has since arisen upon this same subject, is that warning a weapon in your hands against us? Or in our hands against you, could Washington himself speak? Would he cast the blame of that sectionalism upon us? Who sustain his policy, or upon you who repudiate it? We respect that warning of Washington, and we commend it to you together with his example pointing to the right application of it. But you say you are conservative, eminently conservative, while we are revolutionary, destructive, or something of the sort. What is conservatism? Is it not adherence to the old and tried, against the new and untried? We stick to contend for the identical old policy, on the point in controversy which was adopted by our fathers, who framed the government under which we live. While you with one accord reject and scout and spit upon that old policy, and insist upon substituting something new. True, you disagree among yourselves as to what that substitute shall be. You are divided on new propositions and plans, but you are unanimous in rejecting and denouncing the old policy of the fathers. Some of you are for reviving the foreign slave trade. Some for Congress forbidding the territories to prohibit slavery within their limits. Some for maintaining slavery in the territories through the judiciary some for the Gurit principle, that if one man would enslave another. No third man should object, fantastically called popular sovereignty, but never a man among you in favor of federal prohibition of slavery in federal territories. According to the practice of our fathers who framed the government under which we live, not one of all your various plans can show a precedent or an advocate in the century within which our government originated. Consider, then, whether your claim of conservatism for yourselves and your charge of destructiveness against us are based on the most clear and stable foundations. Again, you say we have made the slavery question more prominent than it formerly was. We deny it. We admit that it is more prominent, but we deny that we made it so. It was not we, but you, who discarded the old policy of the fathers. We resisted, and still resist, your innovation, and thence comes the greater prominence of the question. Would you have that question reduced to its former proportions? Go back to that old policy. What has been will be again under the same conditions. If you would have the peace of the old times, readopt the precepts and policy of the old times. You charge that we stir up insurrections among your slaves. We deny it, and what is your proof? Harper's Ferry, John Brown. John Brown was no Republican. And you have failed to implicate a single Republican in his Harper's Ferry enterprise. If any member of our party is guilty in that matter, you know it or you do not know it. If you do know it, you are inexcusable for not designating the man and proving the fact. If you do not know it, you are inexcusable for asserting it 
and especially for persisting in the assertion after you have tried and failed to make the proof. You need not be told that persisting in a charge which one does not know to be true is simply malicious slander. Some of you admit that no Republican designedly aided or encouraged the Harper's Ferry affair, but still insist that our doctrines and declarations necessarily lead to such results. We do not believe it. We know we hold to no doctrine and make no declaration, which was not held to and made by our fathers who framed the government under which we live. You never dealt fairly by us in relation to this affair. When it occurred, some important state elections were near at hand, and you were in evident glee with the belief that by charging the blame upon us you could get an advantage of us in those elections. The elections came, and your expectations were not quite fulfilled. Every Republican man knew that, as to himself at least, your charge was a slander, and he was not much inclined by it to cast his vote in your favor. Republican doctrines and declarations are accompanied with a continual protest against any interference whatever with your slaves or with you about your slaves. Surely, this does not encourage them to revolt. True, we do in common with our fathers, who framed the government under which we live, declare our belief that slavery is wrong. But the slaves do not hear us declare even this. For anything we say or do, the slaves would scarcely know there is a Republican Party. I believe they would not, in fact, generally know it, but for your misrepresentations of us in their hearing, in your political contests among yourselves, each faction charges the other with sympathy with black republicanism. And then, to give point to the charge, defines black republicanism to simply be insurrection, blood and thunder among the slaves. Slave insurrections are no more common now than they were before the Republican Party was organized. What induced the Southampton insurrection 28 years ago, in which, at least, three times as many lives were lost as at Harper's Ferry, you can scarcely stretch your very elastic fancy to the conclusion that Southampton was got up by black republicanism. In the present state of things in the United States, I do not think a general or even a very extensive slave insurrection is possible. The indispensable concert of action cannot be attained. The slaves have no means of rapid communication, nor can incendiary freemen, black or white, supply it. The explosive materials are everywhere in parcels, but there neither are nor can be supplied the indispensable connecting trains. Much is said by Southern people about the affection of slaves for their masters and mistresses, and a part of it, at least, is true. A plot for an uprising could scarcely be devised and communicated to twenty individuals before some one of them to save the life of a favorite master or mistress would divulge it. This is the rule, and the slave revolution in Haiti was not an exception to it, but a case occurring under peculiar circumstances. The gunpowder plot of British history, though not connected with slaves, was more in point. In that case, only about twenty were admitted to the secret, and yet one of them, in his anxiety to save a friend, betrayed the plot to that friend, and by consequence averted the calamity. 
occasional poisonings from the kitchen, and open or stealthy assassinations in the field, and local revolts extending to a score or so, will continue to occur as the natural results of slavery, but no general insurrection of slaves, as I think, can happen in this country for a long time. Whoever much fears, or much hopes for such an event, will be alike disappointed. In the language of Mr. Jefferson, uttered many years ago, it is still in our power to direct the process of emancipation and deportation peaceably, and in such slow degrees, as that the evil will wear off insensibly, and their places be pari passu, filled up by free white laborers. If, on the contrary, it is left to force itself on, human nature must shudder at the prospect held up. Mr. Jefferson did not mean to say, nor do I, that the power of emancipation is in the federal government. He spoke of Virginia, and as to the power of emancipation, I speak of the slaveholding states only. The federal government, however, as we insist, has the power of restraining the extension of the institution, the power to ensure that a slave insurrection shall never occur on any American soil, which is now free from slavery. John Brown's effort was peculiar. It was not a slave insurrection. It was an attempt by white men to get up a revolt among slaves, in which the slaves refused to participate. In fact, it was so absurd that the slaves, with all their ignorance, saw plainly enough it could not succeed. That affair, in its philosophy, corresponds with the many attempts, related in history, at the assassination of kings and emperors. An enthusiast broods over the oppression of a people, till he fancies himself commissioned by heaven to liberate them. He ventures the attempt, which ends in little else than his own execution. Orsini's attempt on Louis Napoleon, and John Brown's attempt at Harper's Ferry were, in their philosophy, precisely the same, the eagerness to cast blame on old England in the one case, and on New England in the other, does not disprove the sameness of the two things. And how much would it avail you, if you could, by the use of John Brown? Helper's book, and the like, break up the Republican organization. Human action can be modified to some extent, but human nature cannot be changed. There is a judgment and a feeling against slavery in this nation, which cast at least a million and a half of votes. You cannot destroy that judgment and feeling, that sentiment, by breaking up the political organization which rallies around it. You can scarcely scatter and disperse an army which has been formed into order in the face of your heaviest fire. But if you could, how much would you gain by forcing the sentiment which created it out of the peaceful channel of the ballot box? into some other channel. What would that other channel probably be? Would the number of John Browns be lessened or enlarged by the operation? But you will break up the Union rather than submit to a denial of your constitutional rights. That has a somewhat reckless sound, but it would be palliated, if not fully justified, were we proposing by the mere force of numbers to deprive you of some right, plainly written down in the Constitution. But we are proposing no such thing. When you make these declarations, you have a specific and well-understood allusion to an assumed constitutional right of yours. 
to take slaves into the federal territories and to hold them there as property. But no such right is specifically written in the Constitution. That instrument is literally silent about any such right. We, on the contrary, deny that such a right has any existence in the Constitution, even by implication. Your purpose, then, plainly stated, is that you will destroy the government unless you be allowed to construe and enforce the Constitution as you please. On all points in dispute between you and us, you will rule or ruin in all events. This, plainly stated, is your language. Perhaps you will say the Supreme Court has decided the disputed constitutional question in your favor. Not quite so, but waiving the lawyer's distinction between dictum and decision, the court have decided the question for you in a sort of way. The court have substantially said, it is your constitutional right to take slaves into the federal territories and to hold them there as property. When I say the decision was made in a sort of way, I mean it was made in a divided court. By a bare majority of the judges, and they not quite agreeing with one another in the reasons for making it, that it is so made as that its about supporters disagree with one another about its meaning, and that it was mainly based upon a mistaken statement of fact, the statement in the opinion, that the right of property in a slave is distinctly and expressly affirmed in the Constitution. An inspection of the Constitution will show that the right of property in a slave is not distinctly and expressly affirmed in it. Bear in mind, the judges do not pledge their judicial opinion that such right is implicitly affirmed in the Constitution, but they pledge their veracity that it is distinctly and expressly affirmed there distinctly, that is, not mingled with anything else expressly, that is, in words meaning just that, without the aid of any inference and susceptible of no other meaning. If they had only pledged their judicial opinion that such right is affirmed in the instrument by implication, it would be open to others to show that neither the word slave nor slavery is to be found in the Constitution, nor the word property even in any connection with language alluding to the things slave or slavery, and that wherever in that instrument the slave is alluded to, he is called a person, and wherever his master's legal right in relation to him is alluded to, it is spoken of as service or labor which may be due, as a debt payable in service or labor. Also, it would be open to show, by contemporaneous history, that this mode of alluding to slaves and slavery instead of speaking of them, was employed on purpose to exclude from the Constitution the idea that there could be property in man. To show all this is easy and certain, when this obvious mistake of the judges shall be brought to their notice. Is it not reasonable to expect that they will withdraw the mistaken statement and reconsider the conclusion based upon it? And then it is to be remembered that our fathers, who framed the government under which we live, the men who made the Constitution, decided this same constitutional question in our favor. Long ago decided it without division among themselves, when making the decision, without division among themselves about the meaning of it after it was made. And so far as any evidence is left, without basing it upon any mistaken statement of facts. Under all these circumstances, do you really feel yourselves justified to break up this government, unless such a court decision as yours is?
shall be at once submitted to as a conclusive and final rule of political action, but you will not abide the election of a Republican president in that supposed event. You say, you will destroy the Union, and then, you say, the great crime of having destroyed it will be upon us. That is cool. A highwayman holds a pistol to my ear, and mutters through his teeth, Stand and deliver, or I shall kill you. And then you will be a murderer. To be sure, what the robber demanded of me, my money was my own. And I had a clear right to keep it, but it was no more my own than my vote is my own. And the threat of death to me, to extort my money, and the threat of destruction to the Union, to extort my vote, can scarcely be distinguished in principle. A few words now to Republicans. It is exceedingly desirable that all parts of this great Confederacy shall be at peace and in harmony. One with another, let us Republicans do our part to have it so. Even though much provoked, let us do nothing through passion and ill temper. Even though the Southern people will not so much as listen to us, let us calmly consider their demands and yield to them if, in our deliberate view of our duty, we possibly can. Judging by all they say and do, and by the subject and nature of their controversy with us, let us determine, if we can, what will satisfy them. Will they be satisfied if the territories be unconditionally surrendered to them? We know they will not. In all their present complaints against us, the territories are scarcely mentioned. Invasions and insurrections are the rage now. Will it satisfy them if, in the future, we have nothing to do with invasions and insurrections? We know it will not. We so know, because we know we never had anything to do with invasions and insurrections. And yet, this total abstaining does not exempt us from the charge and the denunciation. The question recurs, what will satisfy them, simply this, we must not only let them alone, but we must somehow convince them that we do let them alone. This, we know by experience, is no easy task. We have been so trying to convince them from the very beginning of our organization, but with no success. In all our platforms and speeches we have constantly protested our purpose to let them alone. This has had no tendency to convince them. Alike unavailing to convince them is the fact that they have never detected a man of us in any attempt to disturb them. These natural and apparently adequate means all failing, what will convince them, this and this only. Cease to call slavery wrong, and join them in calling it right. Silence will not be tolerated, we must place ourselves avowedly with them. Senator Douglas' new sedition law must be enacted and enforced, suppressing all declarations that slavery is wrong. Whether made in politics, in presses, in pulpits, or in private, we must arrest and return their fugitive slaves with greedy pleasure. We must pull down our free state constitutions. The whole atmosphere must be disinfected from all taint of opposition to slavery before they will cease to believe that all their troubles proceed from us. I am quite aware they do not state their case precisely in this way. Most of them would probably say to us, 
let us alone, do nothing to us, and say what you please about slavery. But we do let them alone, have never disturbed them, so that, after all, it is what we say, which dissatisfies them. They will continue to accuse us of doing, until we cease saying. I am also aware they have not as yet, in terms, demanded the overthrow of our free state constitutions. Yet, those constitutions declare the wrong of slavery, with more solemn emphasis, than do all other sayings against it. And when all these other sayings shall have been silenced, the overthrow of these constitutions will be demanded and nothing be left to resist the demand. It is nothing to the contrary, that they do not demand the whole of this just now. Demanding what they do, and for the reason they do, they can voluntarily stop nowhere short of this consummation. Holding, as they do, that slavery is morally right and socially elevating, they cannot cease to demand a full national recognition of it as a legal right and a social blessing, nor can we justifiably withhold this on any ground save our conviction that slavery is wrong. If slavery is right, all words, acts, laws, and constitutions against it are themselves wrong and should be silenced and swept away if it is right, we cannot justly object to its nationality, its universality. If it is wrong, they cannot justly insist upon its extension, its enlargement. All they ask we could readily grant, if we thought slavery right, all we ask they could as readily grant. If they thought it wrong, their thinking it right, and our thinking it wrong, is the precise fact upon which depends the whole controversy. Thinking it right as they do, they are not to blame for desiring its full recognition as being right. But, thinking it wrong as we do, can we yield to them, can we cast our votes with their view, and against our own, in view of our moral, social and political responsibilities can we do this wrong as we think slavery is we can yet afford to let it alone where it is because that much is due to the necessity arising from its actual presence in the nation but can we while our votes will prevent it allow it to spread into the national territories and to overrun us here in these free states if our sense of duty forbids this, then let us stand by our duty, fearlessly and effectively. Let us be diverted by none of those sophistical contrivances wherewith we are so industriously plied and belabored contrivances such as groping for some middle ground between the right and the wrong. Vain as the search for a man who should be neither a living man nor a dead man such as a policy of don't care on a question about which all true men do care such as union appeals beseeching true union, men to yield to disunionists. Reversing the divine rule and calling not the sinners but the righteous to repentance such as invocations to Washington imploring men to unsay what Washington said, and undo what Washington did. Neither let us be slandered from our duty by false accusations against us, nor frightened from it by menaces of destruction to the government, nor of dungeons to ourselves. Let U.S. have faith that right makes might, and in that faith let U.S. to the end. Dare to do our duty as we understand IT 